继续我哋嘅会议。I think we can resume our meeting now. For the next item, the next item is revision of postal rates and miscellaneous postal fees and charges. I'd like to welcome the officials attending our meeting for this item, and I shall introduce them one by one because we are all familiar with each other. Permanent Secretary, would you walk us through the paper? Thank you. The paper already outlined the uh, proposed adjustments to the postal rates and miscellaneous postal fees. If I may walk,、uh, summarize the proposal. According to the Trading Fund Ordinance, Hong Kong Post operates as a trading fund, and it would need to、uh, achieve the targeted、uh, rate of return laid down by the Financial Secretary. In、uh, in other words, the, the government,、uh, when it proposed the Post Office Trading Fund Ordinance, it has st- st- stipulated that. The adjustments to the postal rates will be in line with the rate of inflation. Hong Kong Post has always been uh, 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 offering competitive services, and over the years, without the need to、uh, increase the rates, have been able to maintain financial stability. Although the income for the fund has gone up, however, cost is escalating all the time, especially for several major cost items, including salary cost.、Uh, And also、uh, increase the terminal charges and also the 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 air freight charges. As a result of financial position of the trading fund、uh, from 2007-08 onwards has been declining, and since the 2011-2012、uh, financial year, it has actually uh, recorded uh, an operating loss. For the 2012-2013 financial year, the operating loss. Will be is expected to be 110 million dollars. Most of the postal charges and the miscellaneous postal fees and charges have not been amended, revised for more than 10 years. The,、uh, the the fund is now already suffering from losses. If we do not adjust the fees and charges, the financial <coughs> condition of the Post office and the trading fund will continue to deteriorate, and all its reserves will be depleted by 2015-2016, thus adversely affecting the operation of the department. Therefore, the <coughs> postmaster general、uh, proposed to increase the major postal charges from October 1st this year.、Uh, And plans to adjust certain postal fees under the post office regulations from December first this year.、Uh, the proposed increase is not substantial. For example,、uh, local mail will be increased from dollar forty to dollar seventy,、uh, increase of thirty cents for air mail to the mainland and Singapore. The basic rate, for example, is increased from two dollar forty to two dollar ninety. For、uh, service mail、uh, going to the mainland, it's increased from a dollar eighteen eighty to two dollar twenty twenty cents. The Singapore,、uh, yeah, it's increased to a dollar eighteen. So the rates are still、uh, <coughs> cheap after the revision compared with other jurisdictions. For example, for Singapore, it's about two dollars. Hong Kong dollars two dollars for air mail around four point one Hong Kong dollars. In actual fact, in the next few years, if the trading fund is to balance its books, the required ranges of increases exceed the proposed increases in the paper. But we. Estimate that, given the present economic situation, business environment, public affordability, affordability, as well as measures of the trading fund in saving costs, we would be able to meet the inflation impact. So we、we'll、continue to open up new revenue resources and reduce costs. And by and large, will follow the inflation rate in adjusting postage. We envisage that the postal increases proposed will not impact hugely on the public at this time. And a one-off、uh, 
mitigation program will be announced later. Questions are welcome. Mr. Wong Kok Heng, Mr. Tan Ka Pyu, Mr. Christopher Chung, and Mr. Yu Si Wing would like to ask questions. Who else? Mr. Ronnie Tong, Mr. Wong Ting Kwong, Mr. Andrew Leung. All right, I'll draw a line there. Three minutes each. Mr. Wong Kok Heng, Mr. Chairman, it's regrettable that you only give us three minutes each. It's too short. Postage is to be increased by 13 to 20 percent as proposals to catch up with inflation. It's regrettable because such increases will affect people's livelihood. Why did you not adopt these mitigation measures in the past? Why now? Because the proposed increases are huge in terms of percentage points. So do you really need such huge increases? And then the trading fund was established in 1995. You have to thoroughly review it. I'm not talking about Mrs. Ting, but a former postmaster general said that the trading fund would allow the post office to make a profit. But when we look back now at the trading fund, we can see that the trading fund is much more problematic than the post office because all along the trading fund staff have criticized this due system of having two categories of staff members. Certain staff members are being exploited. Now hundreds of contract staff are being exploited to the thousands. The problem remains unresolved. If the trading fund does not conduct a comprehensive and thorough review, then on the one hand it will impact further on people's livelihood. At the same time, it is unfair to its staff members who are being exploited. Postal services should be an undertaken public services. The government has also already got a huge revenue from land sales. Well, Mrs. Ting, I sympathize with you. It's very difficult to serve as the Postmaster General. Now, the proposed huge increases are undesirable. The trading fund should also be reviewed. It should not continue. I'll leave dozens of seconds for you to respond. Mrs. Ting, I sympathize with you. Permanent Secretary, you have to respond. Permanent Secretary, as I said in my opening remarks, as far as possible, we would like the trading fund to balance its books without any postal adjustments. However, in the past few years, there was a continued deficit. And just last year, it stood at $110 million by 2015-16, the post office's balance will be exhausted, or surplus will be exhausted, the reserve will be exhausted. Well, you would have uh, gained more even by depositing the money with banks for the staff members. Whether or not the post office operates in the form of a trading fund, it will need both civil servants and contract staff to provide services. Mr. Tenkapu, Mr. Chairman, indeed, it is unique for the post office to have a trading fund. Yes, altogether there are five such departments, but now the trading fund is in trouble. Last year it had a deficit of $110 million, but the staff members suffer most. Over 2,000 contract staff members are employed, the biggest in the civil service, and the longest had a five-year service already. That is, for every three staff members, there's just one civil servant. In March this year, I already wrote to the public service panel in the hope that we can have a joint discussion. Well, before we succeed in queuing up, uh, they 
secretly proposed these increases. Yes, they claim that the increases were not huge. There have not been any increases for 10 years already, but the percentage points are high. But they have gone to EXCO already, so they turned a blind eye to the LegCo for other projects. Before they went to the EXCO, they came to LegCo first. Why is it that they didn't do the same for these postal increases? I'm very dissatisfied that they're only notifying us. There's no consultation. I've actually prepared a motion to be moved later. Permanent Secretary, as I explained, if the financial position of the trading fund has improved, we would not have proposed such increases for 2011-12 and 2012-13 up to now. The financial position is not satisfactory. Staff cost, air conveyances and terminal fees will be increased in the coming years. So we have to propose such postage increases which are necessary. Of course, the post office is unique in its operations. If I remember correctly, one one thousand contract colleagues work a few hours per day only for the provision of sorting services, and all along the post office had employed contract staff to do the work. Mr. Christopher Chang. Mr. Chairman, it's a fact that postage hasn't been increased for many, many years. The trading fund has suffered a deficit. But to implement a 20% increase in one go is undesirable because that will impact a huge pressure on companies. General postage to be increased from $1.4 to $1.7 for bulk local mail. The increases will be up to $1.52. That will add to the operational cost of the companies. For securities firms, sales and purchases, posting of documents, etc., etc., the monthly postal costs are very high. Can you phase this proposed 20% increase such that you can ease the burden on companies? Permanent Secretary, Mr. Chairman, we did consider whether we should affect the increases in one goal or in phase. I understand members' remarks that the proposed increases are huge in percentage, but the actual increases in money terms are not that huge. For users of postal services, they may be affected in the next few months. So in the paper, we explain that with one-off relief measures to assist the SMEs, such that some SMEs will still be able to make use of the postal services. At the moment, many services provided by the post office have substitutes in the market, so there's competition. Services provided by the post office at the moment are not unique in the market. Users have other choices. I hope that by way of the quality service of the post office, even with postage increases, the post office would still be able to get businesses. 
Mr. Chairman, in terms of opening up new resources of revenue and save co saving of costs, can we have other measures like uh, collection, stamp collection and collection of souvenirs, etc., may boost their revenue? Perhaps I should defer to the post office for other measures to increase revenue. In that regard, we've always been supporting the business sector. We recently offer counter services for the small items. And then for stamps, we issue over 10 sets of theme stamps every year. There are also postal souvenirs, such that users and the business sector can give uh, to their business partners, customers, etc. And we also have online cards, greeting cards, uh, to raise revenue. In future, we'll increase more such new services in order to increase our revenue. Mr. Yu Si Wing, I understand that postages haven't been increased for 11 years, but the proposed increases are really too huge. On the average, it's 20 percent. Sometimes it's not that you cannot afford the increases, but all these will go beyond the budget of the business sector. So in future, when the post office reviews its postages, it should conduct reviews more frequently, maybe in five-year cycles. Don't just think of yourself, so don't just plan for yourselves. And then in paragraph 16, relief measures to SMEs are mentioned. A five-way, a five percent discount for the first three thousand dollars of stamps purchased. Can it be increased? Five percent is too little. Of course, I want twenty percent, if possible. Now, young people. Nowadays, use emails and online services more, but for the aged population, they don't know computers, so they will use postal services. So, for private customers, you should offer a concession as well, maybe a twenty to thirty percent concession for a purchase of three hundred dollars. And to the disadvantaged, you should also offer concessions. What do you think, Permanent Secretary? On the members' suggestions, since we've not been increasing postages for so many years, given this proposed increase, we understand that uh, there will be quite a bit of reaction from the business sector. We'll take note of that. In future, we won't implement adjustments after such a long period of time. Every two years, we'll review the postages to see whether they need to be adjusted. As for discounts, if the discount is too huge, we will not be able to improve the financial position of the post office. This 5% discount proposed is a one-off relief to SMEs. To a certain extent, such a discount will be able to help enterprises. Apart from enterprises, will individual citizens be affected hugely by the proposed increases? Before proposing such adjustments, we've looked at uh, the figures. Indeed, uh, not that many individuals use postal services nowadays. Mr. Ronnie Tong, Mr. Chairman, should the government not uh, jump out uh, of uh, its restrictions in thoughts, so to speak, even on the mainland? Uh, they have new ideas for postal services. Cash discount or rebate 
is rather rare in other jurisdictions. Almost throughout other jurisdictions in the world, postal services suffer a deficit because postal services is a basic public service. Why should the government ask the public to shoulder the deficits of postal services? Is it that the administration is short of $100 million, without which the government can no longer operate? That is not the fact. The government has a huge reserve. So why should it be so mean on postal services? Permanent Secretary, thank you, Mr. Tong, for your remarks. The postal services of most jurisdictions in the world have already been privatized for the trading fund, the post office trading fund. At the moment, we have no plan to change it, that is, to change this modus operandi. Yes, it is uh, one of uh, our government departments in the provision of services. Still, we have to see whether it can balance its books. Although the post office is now a trading fund, not a government department, it has to review its financial position to see whether or not it can balance its books. I have to re reiterate that even after this adjustment exercise, the postal office the postal services will still suffer a deficit. It doesn't mean that after this adjustment exercise we'll make a profit. Mr. Chairman, throughout the whole world, there are not that many jurisdictions that are so rich uh, as we, who we have uh, a reserve uh, of trillions of dollars to use. Mr. Chairman, they're passing the buck to the public. Postal services uh, will eventually diminish or even vanish as a result, because throughout the world, postal services are vanishing. So the government should show them more responsibilities. Chairman, I really want the government to show them more responsibilities. Permanent Secretary? As I said just now, even after this adjustment exercise, in the coming few years, the post office will um, face um, a deficit in the coming years. So uh, it will focus on uh, competitive mail services uh, to increase revenue. Mr. Wang Ting Kuang. Thank you, Chairman. Now, it's been 11 years since the postage rates were last increased. And uh, it need, uh, the rates need to catch up with inflation. I also understand. As for um, the uh, phased uh, increase of postage rates, as mentioned by the other member, I think the administration should also so think about it. I also understand the trend of privatizing postal services. Now, the trading fund uh, is uh, running. Uh, um, out of money, and uh, the administration can su consider um, fund injection to avoid a substantial uh, fair hike. I understand postal services will it's a service um, at the international level. We need to provide service to incoming mail uh, as well. Well, if um, the postage rates elsewhere uh, go up, it doesn't mean that Hong Kong will, uh, or the local mail service will uh, get a share of um, the their gain. So we need to come up with ways to prevent operating losses as well. And many um, and um, many of the competitive mail services are affected by uh, some privately run um, courier service uh, as already. So I understand the post office is facing quite a lot of pressure. Can the administration tell us uh, ways of increasing revenue apart from um, those uh, mentioned by the Postmaster General? Uh, do we have any new thinking? 
Now, uh, in the mainland, um, they spent only uh, eight cents in the past uh, in order to write to us uh, for help. But now, the uh, postage rates on the mainland uh, have gone up substantially as well, way more than eight cents. Yes. Well, of course, the postal office will continue. The post office will uh, continue to uh, explore um, channels to increase avenue. As mentioned just now, for airmail and international airmail, uh, of course, we charge um, the um, our counterpart um, the uh, processing fees, and uh, likewise for outgoing international airmail, uh, we need to pay the charge. If we do not adjust the postage rates, we're using um, we're using the rates that were set uh, more than ten years ago, and uh, for the uh, air conveyance cost, uh, it's already very high nowadays. And may I invite the postmaster general to uh, tell us uh, something about the new thinking? Apart from exploring new. Uh, channels of revenue. We also attach importance to saving costs. We make good use of uh, information technology. For example, we have um, developed um, some um, uh, integrated postal service system for automating counter operations so that uh, it can uh, boost pro productivity and will streamline back end support functions. Uh, also, a two mail services center will be combined. Um, um, the sorting center will be combined uh, to one in Kowloon uh, Bay to uh, increase uh, productivity. Automated sorting. Uh, this is already in practice. Uh, we can already um, interpret English addresses, and uh, we are looking into automated sorting. Um, of Chinese uh, mail, mail addresses, we hope that uh, through with a two-pronged approach can be taken cost saving uh, and revenue generation, so as to um, control um, the our finances more properly. Well, I can uh, give you an advice uh, to avoid any interception of communication. Um, on e or eavesdropping of email, you should use the postal service. Some members have raised ha the hand uh, after the line has been drawn, but um, I need to keep watch of the time. I cannot allow these members to speak. Uh, last, Mr. Andrew Low. As mentioned by P.S. just now, um, there was uh, a problem with uh, the handling fee. Um, Mr. Lau, please move the mic. No, I can't control it. No, you can. You can move the mic closer to your um, to you. All right. So uh, on the one hand, you need to save uh, costs and um, generate uh, revenues. On the other hand, with increased postage rates, you'll be more competitive. And what other concession measures can you give to SMEs uh, locally? As mentioned by uh, Christopher Jung, uh, security firms and other SMEs uh, are subject to a lot of um, banking regulations. They are required to send documents by post instead of uh, sending, say, notification via email. So we are worried uh, how um, these um, SMEs will be affected and what can be done to help them. So uh, after increasing postage rates, can you um, do something to help um, local users or uh, face the increase? Well, just now, Chairman uh, says that a postal service can um, it's not subject to uh, interception of communication. I understand that there is a um, e-certificate um, service online. Um, can something be done to increase revenue? Uh, on the uh, now second point, privatization is an international trend, even for the UK's Royal Mail. It has a history of 500 years, and now um, they are um, undergoing privatization as well. However, we are 
um, neither flesh or fowl. We have a trading fund is run uh, like a commercial organization, but we are neither. So will this be considered by the administration in the long run? Maybe I will reply or respond to uh, Mr. Long's at last point, and I'll defer to the Postmaster General for the rest of the question. We do allow flexibility um, to, for the post office to provide um, the services uh, most needed by the sec uh, most needed by the community by using a training fund. Without a training fund, um, there will be a lack of flexibility um, on the services for the public. That's for privatization in the coming years. The uh, prospect for the post office is not very good, um, so uh, privatization is not on our agenda. But we'll try our best to improve the POTF. Postmaster General, as for help for SMEs or the commercial sector, well, even after the substantial increase in postage rates and postal fees uh, for bulk mail. Um, well, it's still um, at a concessionary rate, and we're considering whether a special approach can be taken. Well, uh, at the sorting stage, uh, those bulk mail will be uh, classified, so it's uh, for mutual benefit as for um, a digital certificate. We're also doing something about it on the e-certificate. Um, with our increased awareness in cyber cyber security, we uh, foresee um, uh, a further development of this uh, area of business. Now, lastly, um, a question for the administration. I see that there are runoff concessionary measures for the SME in the paper, and uh, the direction is good, but uh, only five percent is gone for the first three thousand dollars of stamps. Well, that's too little. I want to uh, declare uh, in, uh, interest at first. Every year I use bulk mail several times to uh, send my reports by post. I believe that many members here also use the service of bulk mail. So will the administration consider offering more concessions or discount? Many members uh, have to use the service anyway, but for SMEs, as mentioned by Andrew Leung, Christopher Zhang, and Wong Ting Kuang, over the past few years, um, um, the business sector has been having a very hard t uh, time um, because um, all the fees and rates are going up, and now including the postal rates as well. So can some consideration be given? Can more discount be given? Yes. Now, for this one-off concessionary measure, um, it will cost forty-five million dollars on the part of the um, post office, and uh, against the backdrop of uh, one hundred and ten million dollars lost incurred last year, this concession uh, accounts for a very large percentage. So. We're asking for an adjustment of the postage rates because of the um, uh, risk that the post office is facing. Well, as mentioned by Postmaster General just now, we can go back and consider whether uh, there are other ways uh, to provide more concession. For example, for our bulk mail, maybe we can provide um, more attractive discount uh, to uh, attract more business and also provide more concession uh, for uh, customers of bulk mail service. And this will also help um, the Hong Kong Post. Now, some ask uh, whether the um, increase can be uh, phased instead of a substantial increase uh, once every five or ten years. Now, I also reflected this view to the administration, but. Um, but uh, some also say that um, annual increase would be um, very cumbersome and a uh, waste of resources. I think PS should go back and consider how the adjustment or how frequent adjustments should take place. Now, if um, 
an adjustment isn't uh, done once every 10 years. Some may say that the increase is too substantial. I think in two years' time, we're going to review the postage rates again. We're not minded to have an annual adjustment exercise or annual review. In any case, uh, we hope that if we have a review on on a, uh, if we review more frequently, um, the uh, adjustment will not be so substantial. Mr. Tan Capio has moved the motion. I'll read it out and seek members' views. This panel expresses strong dissatisfaction uh, against the. Um, decision of the post office in adjusting postage rates without informing um, the adjustment, um, informing the electrical of the adjustment beforehand. This system or this mechanism allows the uh, post to uh, circumvent the Legislative Council on, on the revision of postage rates directly. Uh, so such that in the process the um the public's views um have not been heeded and um the uh, public's affordability on the fair, uh, on the fees adjustments have been neglected and the panel urges the administration to in enhance the transparency in reviewing the postage rate adjustment and to do everything to alleviate the uh impact on the public uh, with those in favor of um, handling this uh, motion, please raise your hand. Two. Uh, those against, none. So may I invite uh, Mr. Tan Kapil to say something about your motion. Thank you, Chairman. I think we're all concerned about the uh, operating prospect of the post office and its continuing uh, continuous, uh, continuing uh, operation if uh, no adjustment is made. But this adjustment is very substantial, as said just now, and we need more transparency. Some ask whether um, this can be phased, and some ask whether advanced. Um, notification can be given to the commercial sector, and all these views are actually a response to the suggestion that um, this uh, adjustment proposal should be uh, submitted to LegCo for um, consultation first um, before submitting to EXCO. Uh, any other views? If not, I'll put this to a vote. Will those in favor of the motion please raise their hands? Thank you. One. Those against, please raise your hand. Uh, I support Chairman. Sorry. We're voting on Mr. Thank motion. Will those in favor, please raise your hands. Two. Those against, abstention. Two four, none against, five abstentions. So the motion is carried. Lastly, I need to seek members' views on whether they support the legislative proposal. Do we endorse the legislative proposal? Chairman, may I explain? Now, for the adjustment of principal postage rates, um, no subsidiary legislation is needed. But for miscellaneous postage, postal fees and charges, including the uh, post box charges and regist registered mail charges, um, these require subsidiary legislative amendment. And our plan is to submit the subsidiary legislation or table the subsidiary legislation to LegCo uh, in October when it resumes. Any views, Mr. Wong Ting Kwong? So, so Mr. Tang Kapu's motion is contradictory. This mechanism allows the 
post office to directly circumvent the Legislative Council on matters relating to um, the in, uh, fees increase. Well, I'm talking about this sentence. So it means um, it's con uh, is contradicting the uh, miscellaneous postal fees and charges which require subsidiary legislation. I will ask PS to answer your question. PS, your explanation. Like I said, for principal postage rates, including um, service mail, uh, local mail, and um, ML, according to the existing legislation, the Postmasters General can adjust the postage rates um, and for miscellaneous postal fees and charges, as explained just now and as set out in the paper, including the uh, fees for private letter box, uh, let, uh, private boxes, and also a re registration fee. These can only be revised via subsidiary legislation. So, for the latter part of the. Uh, proposal. We plan to submit the relevant um, subsidiary legislative proposal to LegCo in October for scrutiny. So I repeat, Mr. Tankapu's motion is a suggestion, is not legally binding. It's a non binding motion. As for the administration's paper today in relation to the subsidiary legislation, well, that is a legislative proposal. So these are two different matters. Mr. Tang Papu, as mentioned just now, for increase from um, $1.4 to $1.7, well, n no consultation is needed. That's why they need to heed the views of LegCo. Um, legislative proposal, coming back to LegCo, uh, any, uh, uh, do we all agree? Yes. So the panel um, endorses this proposal. So, so much for this item. Thank you. Thank you, representatives of the administration, for um, attending our meeting. We move on to the next item. Protection of the interests of consumers using telecommunication services. I'll invite the government officials in. Those attending, uh, we have... Um, Mr. Zhou Wang, Deputy Secretary for Commerce and Economic Development, and Mr. Ivan Ho Chang, Principal Assistant Secretary for Commerce and Economic Development, and Ms. Manda Chan, PAS, and Mr. Danny Lau, Deputy Director General of Communications, Mr. Sander Chuck, Assistant Director of um, Office of the Communications Authority, Mr. Sidney Dunn. Head Regulatory Four, uh, Office of the uh, Communications Authority, and also Mr. Stephen Ho, Chairman of the Communications Association of Hong Kong. Welcome to you all. First of all, uh, could you walk us through the paper, Mr. Ho? Thank you, Chairman. I'll say a few words, and then I'll ask my colleagues to brief members. Uh, first of all, the Hong Kong telecom market is driven rapidly. Different types of mobile and broadband services is, <coughs> uh, uh, are widely available. We have more than 16 million subscribers, penetration rate more than 28 percent. The telecom, the, the communication authority as regulator has closely monitored the development and operation of the market. While maintaining the open telecom market and ensuring fair competition, we also take our importance to the, uh, in, to the rights of uh, consumers in using such services and regulate the industry according to the telecommunication ordinance. Furthermore, the communication authority will provide regulation and encourage the industry to adopt <coughs> self-regulation in order to enhance protection for e e consumer interests. If you allow me, Chairman, I'll ask my colleagues to uh, highlight the um, paper to members. Mr. Cham, thank you. Today, we're here to brief members on uh, on paper CB one one five two two stroke twelve 
2-13, which is about the protection of the interests of consumers using telecommunication services. The purpose is that the is about the regulatory measures the CA adopts to regulate uh, 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 unfair trade practices and also uh, the implementation of the self-regulatory regime or scheme in relation to the conclusion of telecom service contracts. Uh, early on, a member, you know, wrote to the the panel expressing his concerns about uh, malpractices and also how we can uh, enhance the protection of consumers' interests. Having con conducted a after conducted a study, I think the relevant legislation involved in are the following. First of all, the uh, Section 7M of Telecom Ordinance, and also the 2012 uh, Trade Trade Description Amendment Ordinance, and thirdly, the self record regime of the telecom industry, and also the Code of Practice for a respect of telecommunication uh, service contracts. First of all, regarding 7M of the Telecom Ordinance. Uh, the Section 7M requires the – Mr. Chum, if you're going to read from the paper, I think you've already circulated the paper to us. Why don't you simply highlight the main points? If you're going to read the paper, I don't think that is necessary. If I may, uh, then uh, uh, you know, focus on the highlights. Uh, starting from 2000, the main uh, penalty is a fine. Under Section 7M, uh, the amendment ordinance was already uh, passed uh, last week, and that was over the last decade from the year 2000 until now. Uh, there were 570 investigations pursuing the Section 7M, of which 70 cases have been uh, found to be <coughs> in breach, and we've actually uh, imposed penalties ranging from $25,000 to $33,000. Next. The amendment ordinance came into effect uh, on the 17th of July, and for telecom services, if the operator uh, is found to engage in <coughs> uh, unfair trade practices, then they will be subject to a penalty. Maximum penalty is half a million dollars and five years imprisonment. Telecom services are included un within the ambit of this amendment ordinance. Basically, the Customer Excise Department will enforce the TDO. The Telecom, the Communication Authority also has jurisdiction in respect of the uh, licensee under the Broadcast Authority and Telecom Services. Uh, uh, the Communication Authority will enforce the TDO. Uh, and finally, I'd like to come back to the Code of Practice. The CA doesn't have any legal authority to deal with uh, co disputes regarding telecom service contracts. In 2011, we uh, we uh, trade we come up with uh, a code of practice, and we also laid down the principles. Today, we are very happy that the chairman of the communication uh, uh, association of Hong Kong is also in attendance today. Uh, and for the last two years, we know that there's been a 13 de percent decline in the number of uh, complaints. And also in May this year, together with the Telecom uh, Association of Hong Communication Service, we discussed with them uh, how we may amend the, the contract, the agreement. In summary, the enforcement of 7M has been effective over the years. The amendment ordinance also includes the prevention of uh, unfair trade practices in the telecom industry, and the self regulatory regime within the industry also is working well. We also encourage the trade to further enhance the self regulatory regime. Thank you, Chairman. We have Mr. Wong Kok Heng, Tang Ka Piu. Scott Lai Kong, Song Ting Kong, and Ronnie Tong. Are there anyone else who would like to speak? If not, I'll draw a line there. Each member will have four minutes, beginning with Mr. Wong Kok Heng. Thank you. The telecom industry, uh, regarding the telecom industry, I have received many complaints. Uh, 
the latest, according to the latest report from the administration, uh, we now have the industry code and also the uh, trade, the latest amended version of the trade TDL, uh, which came into effect last week. Last week, and also Section Seven M of the uh, Telecommunication Ordinance. So my question for the uh, administration is this: According to your report, the industry code. Uh, was implemented in 2011, and since then a number of complaints have been steadily falling. Now, if the trade does not follow the industry code, if there should be some, such an incident, uh, the uh, the uh, associate Ch chairman is also present here today. My question for you is: How do you pa punish uh, those who are in breach, and how would you follow up on those breaches? And secondly, uh, question for the administration: We now have three things in place. We have Section 7M and the, and the amended trade description ordinance, which came into the last week, and the industry code. How does the administration deal with all the three regulatory requirements? Which one do you follow? Joe, if I may uh, answer the second part of the question regarding question relating to the code, I'll ask Mr. Ho to supplement. Regarding the three points, 7M, the industry code, and the amended ordinance. The amended ordinance came into effect on the 19th of July. Section 7M of tele the telecom ministry is now, uh, is now uh, uh, no longer in force. So, so we now, we, so we are now relying on the uh, uh, TDO and fair trade practices, and as well as the industry code. Which will continue to insist. If unfair trade practices involved, then it will be uh, governed by the new amendment ordinance. But for issues relating to the contents of a telecommunication or co service contract, uh, it may not be directly related to unfair trade practices, but sometimes it could be due to misunderstanding. Uh, so, for, in this case, the industry code will play a very important role because it can help the consumers and the service provider to resolve such disputes. So, I'll now invite Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Ho to supplement on uh, on the point about the industry code, Mr. Lau. In in the telecom ordinance. It, uh, the communication or telecom authority is not given the authority to deal with uh, issues relating to consumer contracts, but the the industry code, on the other hand, is a voluntary code uh, adopted by the, the trade in order to protect consumer interest. Well, it's been implemented for two years, and we've not come across any single case of the breach of the code. Members ask what happened if the code were breached. Uh, when the code was implemented, we already said that this code. Well, all the operators have undertaken to abide by the code. If there is any non-compliance, would this would this constitute a breach of the TDO or the communication telecommunication ordinance? We will explore this. We we'll certainly explore this. Uh, Point as to whether or not they've actually violated uh, or, 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 or uh, renege on their uh, undertaking. Well, in the, I think the industry code is actually more advanced than the uh, TDO uh, amended TDO uh, because the existing ordinance uh, uh, provide for a seven-day. Uh, uh, Cool off period. So I'd like to know how you can ensure the trade will also uh, follow that requirement. Well, the uh, industry code is a code, a voluntary code uh, arrived at after we've uh, talked to the industry. The government does not uh, have any policy requirements regarding the cooling uh, period. Since the trade has responded to the uh, request from the public, they've not, they have proposes uh, they have come with this proposal of a cooling off period, which we welcome. We also 
Well, after the code has been uh, implemented for two years, we are now starting a review with the trade to see where we can make further improvements. Mr. Tan Ka Pio. Well, I'm exactly concerned about the industry code. And I, uh, but f many electrical members actually have received complaints. You, like you said, there have been some movements uh, over the, in recent years. But one, the complaints we receive is that the uh, well, regarding the seven-day cooling off period, the de the defect there is that once the service uh, started, you have all kinds of cold calls or unsolicited calls. People ask you, "What do you want to uh, have broadband service?" Once you say yes, you know <clears throat> the the line is connected in two hours, and the cooling off period automatically uh, will not be valid. And secondly, when the uh, contract is renewed, uh, when they call you up, they will say, "If you opt for the broadband service, they give you other services and so on." So. I'd like to ask a, a question of a more technical nature because you're going to conduct a technical review. So I think I think in under the TDO you should you know do a better job in making a legislation uh, coming up with a legislation regarding the seven day cooling off period. I'll ask the colleagues from the telecom authority to respond. I'd like to explain to Mr. Tang that the seven day cooling off period you say that the consumer said the consumer after the the operator has uh, called him up and then after two hours later the connection is made. Well, basically the right is in the hands of the consumer. If you want installation, would you allow him to make the installation immediately? We agree that the different types of cooling off period, making it mandatory that the installation can only be done after seven days. But the cooling off period, I think when we talk to the tray, we agree that under normal circumstances, if the consumer himself uh, I want to make good use of the cooling off period, he can exercise that right. He can tell the operator that I like to think about it first. And according to our uh, the complaints that we have received in the past over the uh, over the years, the complaints regarding the cooling off period only made up a small percentage of the complaints we receive. And in May this year, I had written uh, to the association uh, requesting them to conduct a review as to how, whether they can make some changes to the cooling off period. Perhaps the chairman of the Communication Association can also respond here. Mr. Ho. Thank you, Mr. Tang. Mr. Lau already explained that. Earlier, the telecom communication had already been liaised with our association uh, regarding the issue of the seven-day cooling off period and other issues. All our mem we are now liaising with all our members at the moment regarding the seven-day cooling off period. There might still be uh, after we discussed uh, the details. We thought that perhaps the we can perhaps enhance uh, communication with the consumers so that they don't know. Where once so that once the service uh, begins, there will be no cooling off period. Well, we are a very advanced society, and uh, of course we are, would, uh, we are prepared to adopt an open mind, and, and we are prepared to continue to review the effectiveness of the regime. But s since the TDO has been amended and came into effect on the 19th of July, uh, that. For the industry, uh, they may be more uh, concerned and preoccupied with 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 uh, uh, with that, and perhaps the industry. Uh, them, so regarding the industry call, there might be some delay. Well, the re so we want to consider enacting legislation for the seventy uh, cooling off period. Ms. Chen. Well, the member. As the member suggested, the newly amended TDO came into effect last week. The new ordinance will provide for, uh, you know, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, deliberate uh, omission or different types of malpractices. 
misleading omission. Uh, maybe I repeat again: the new uh, uh, trade description amendment ordinance will propose certain new offences like false trade description, misleading omissions, aggressive commercial practices, and bait advertising. Uh, are aim at tackling these unscrupulous practices. Well, it's the <coughs> ordinance has only been commissioned for uh, 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 enforced for a few days. We'll see. We'll monitor its effectiveness, and if we is we find that the cooling off period uh, works, then we'll be able to deal with uh, these uh, tra uh, unscrupulous trade practices before and after the, uh, the enactment of the law. The C and E D have been this, uh, uh, closely in contact with the trade. And be even before the commencement of the ordinance, the trade has already been, <clears throat> you know, uh, reviewing or correcting some of the practices which are not fair. As to whether or not, actually, last Wednesday, the secretary mentioned in this council that uh, issues like whether the consumers can enjoy the service during the cooling off period, and if they do, should they be charged and uh, and with certain charges be transferred onto the shoulder of the consumers. We we'll certainly continue to look into those issues. I declare that our meeting will be extended to 12:45. Mr. Mok Lai Kwong, thank you. We're talking about protection of consumer interests uh, 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 for the telecom industry. Well, now that the TDO has be, amendment has come into effect, now after the end of the amendment, we also have the industry code. So, my first question is that: uh, Have you ever, ever have you checked whether there are any conflicts between the amended ordinance and the industry code, and also how you can further coordinate the two? Some people have told, reflected to me that on the one hand. Uh, the trade is asking the question. That is, if I fully comply with the industry code, I will not be in breach of the t uh, trade um, uh, uh, description or uh, amendment ordinance. On the other hand, the public will say that you, since you already have the ordinance in place, why do you now? Uh, and we also have the code uh, in place, and yet, like Mr. Wang Hing said, there are things in the code which are not clearly spelled out in the law, and some consumers will have the impression that. If you come up with a code and you continue to use the code, are they are you, uh, you know, letting off uh, those people who are uh, in breach of the uh, rules or, or ordinance? Concerning the trade descriptions amendment ordinance, in terms of acts and behaviour as well as regulation, there are a number of unclear areas. First of all. Up to this moment, the industry does not understand the six points of law enforcement. They don't really know the difference between the communications ordinance or communications authority and other law enforcement agencies. In fact, not just telecommunications companies are offering telecommunications products. Communications operators are actually selling a lot of other products. Given the new piece of legislation, they are still asking questions. It's just like last Saturday, it was announced that in two weeks' time, there will be a seminar organized with representation from the government and the industry. Just within three days, over 100 persons registered for the seminar. And Mr. Ho will also attend the seminar. So there will be publicity and promotion on the new law, and I believe industry will actively participate in all sorts of activities. Can you ask them to reply or re respond? I'll first of all explain the differences between the law and the code, 
and maybe the CA can supplement in a moment concerning unclear differentiation of roles and functions between the Customs and Excise Department and the CA. Well, maybe the division of work is clear, but the industry does not understand. Be it the MOU or law enforcement guidelines, we've already explained clearly the division of work. Basically, the CA will only be concerned about unscrupulous practices and sales services in the industry. If telecommunications and broadcasting are involved, then the CA will take action. For the remaining areas, it will be the responsibilities of the Customs and Excise Department. We're asked whether we could work harder. Well, we did keep in liaison with the industry. In early July, we arranged a briefing for the industry. Of course, we can do a lot more in that regard. Understand that the CA is very willing to arrange more briefings on the impact of the law on the industry. Can I ask my colleagues in the CA to supplement concerning the code as well as the trade description and fair trade practices amendment ordinance? I have to say the termination of services, change of addresses, renewal, etc., are covered by the industry code, which regulates acts and behavior. For signing of the MOU, service agreements, etc., in between, are there menacing provisions or practices and so forth? The code spells out the details of each and every item, and the amendment ordinance regulates misleading acts and behavior. So is a due track approach. The amendment ordinance is a big framework to oversee the whole industry to see whether there is any breach of the ordinance. So there shouldn't be any conflict between the two. Finally, Permanent Secretary. Oh, sorry, I have two other members on my list. Mr. Wong Teng Kwong. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for not forgetting me. I have a question for the Bureau. Apart from the industry code, apart from regulating telecommunication services, have you invited consumers and members of the public to participate in the whole exercise to offer advice to them. Recently, some members of the public told me that with the opening up of the telecommunications market, keener competition has resulted. Many telecommunications companies are offering concessions to their customers. For existing customers, they somehow feel that new customers receive preferential treatment while existing customers are being bullied. Why? They did consult customers, but the concessions for new customers are very often greater than those for existing customers. Existing customers do not receive any concessions. They're only notified of what services they are getting. And if existing customers shift to other operators and service providers, they'll be able to receive concessions and gifts, etc. So after some calculation, these existing customers somehow feel that the service providers are actually cheating existing customers by just offering concessions to new customers. From what I can see from the amendment ordinance and the industry code, there are no restrictions to such practices. So will you bring in the public 
in the formulation of the code. Don't let the industry work behind closed doors. As for certain acts and behaviour, I dare not say that they are against the law, but some members of the public feel that new customers receive preferential treatment while existing customers are being bullied. Who will answer this, Mr. Lau? In the CA, we have a, a consumer consultative committee with representatives from the consumers. They offer us advice, and we do hold regular meetings. As for the formulation of the code, frankly speaking, we directly get information from consumers' complaints. We know what complaints there were, what problems there were, and we target systemic problems in revising the code. The information will also be discussed with the Telecommunications Consumers Consultative Committee to see whether there are any views from the consumers. Before we pass the information to the Association for Consideration. So, Mr. Wong, we're certain that we have the mechanism there, and we continuously monitor the market. From the complaints we receive, we'll be able to know where the problems lie. If councillors have any complaints, they should pass them on to us, so that we'll know the information and follow up on them. Mr. Wong, all along, what I knew was that consumers are only consulted. They do not participate in the formulation exercise of the code. In the consultative committee, they offer advice, but there's no binding effect on you. Is the association that formulates the code? I understand that not even the government can participate in the formulation of the code. So that's Mr. Wong's comments. Finally, Mr. Ronnie Tong. Mr. Chairman, the effect of the industry code is not huge because it is not legally binding. The previous section seven M and the amendment ordinance are problematic. Section seven M regulated unfair trade practices. Details are spelt out. As there are so many details, some acts and behaviour are not covered. Let me cite an example. If in a telecommunications agreement there are saving clauses, and some details may only be printed in very small fonts, and certain provisions and terms may not be clear enough. Therefore, such omissions and unclear contents of the telecommunication agreements may not be against the law, but are cheating practices insofar as consumers are concerned. In recent times, members of the public and the media were very concerned about the provisions in the amendment ordinance. Some examples were cited just now. In promoting telecommunication services, the salesman may say something, but not all. They may speak very quickly, and consumers may be cheated. Such acts and behaviour may not breach the amendment ordinance, but. They're not helpful to the consumers at all. Can you change the industry code into some form of a subsidiary legislation so that it will have some legally binding forces? May I say something about the code? 
from our standpoint, the code is effective to a certain extent. The number of complaints has been declining. Of course, if the pace of decline is quicker, it will be even better. But every year there was a 10 up percent decline. The original Section 7M of the TO and the amendment ordinance whether or not they cover unscrupulous trade practices, whether there's any misleading content, etc., etc., it really depends on the evidence and the contents of the agreements under Section 7M. In the code, there are instructions to the effect that Agreements must not be written or printed in exceedingly small fonts. It's not just the industry, the telecommunications industry, even other trades and industries are concerned about possible further expansion of the amendment ordinance. So it's not just an issue for the telecommunications industry. I'm not saying that the industry code is ineffective at all or unhelpful at all. But Chairman is a toothless tiger. We should have detailed guidelines for the observance of the industry. And an industry code should be legally binding. So the government should consider using subsidiary legislation to further regulate the sales practices of the telecommunications industry. Well, we understand the Honourable Member's point, but in regulating the telecommunications industry, we don't want to specially target that particular industry and treat it specially by way of a piece of subsidiary legislation while other trades and industries are not subject to the same regulatory control. As for the number of complaints when compared with advanced countries like the UK and Australia, our number of complaints is substantially lower than theirs. This indicates that the existing regulatory regime is quite ideal. I'll extend this meeting by another five minutes. Permanent. Deputy Secretary and other officials, I'm also a victim. I think I can really say on behalf of other colleagues uh, and, the, and the consumers, you see, when they want you to sign a new contract, they can promise you everything. But when it comes to renewal, everything is automatically loaded over. The flexibility always rests with the operator or the service provider. The consumers have no flexibility at all. They have to swallow whatever is given to us. Just now, Mr. Lau said that he had heard a lot of similar views and he would handle them. How? They may say that they've heard our opinion. They cannot go back and ask the service providers to give us more concessions. Systemically, these service providers are, in the terms of our colleagues, cheating their customers. But in fact, in law, they are not cheating customers. They are only resorting to unscrupulous sales practices to sell their products or services. If they act in accordance with the existing laws, you, it's very difficult for you to handle them. You can only say that they're using unscrupulous practices, sales practices. You really cannot rectify such unscrupulous behavior. Now, we've heard many views in this regard. How can we make uh, the, 
service providers and operators to be more scrupulous. Quality assurance is very important. Any better measures from you? Thank you, Chairman. Well, we're forever living in tension. The business sector and the consumers are always in tension. We try to strike a balance for the code. It did not exist in the past. With this code, there are certain advantages. That is, throughout the whole industry, there are common standards. Chairman, concerning your remarks, in future, when we revise the code, we'll ask the operators and service providers to heed to heed consumers' views. Unscrupulous sales practices, for example, misleading sales tactics, borderline remarks, etc., etc., should be handled. As for the fonts, you may need bigger fonts. Small fonts are difficult to read. Renewal sales can be done in advance, etc., etc. So we'd like to uphold the consumer's interests. In the review, all these will be covered. Mr. Chan, oh, Mr. Lau. Chairman, concerning your remarks about automatic renewal, the code specifies that there shouldn't be any automatic renewal. Renewal must be done with the consumer's consent so the chairman can give us uh, more information after the meeting because automatic renewal is against the code. Yes, if you have uh, any case, do let us know. A consumer may make inquiries. The agent may no longer be working there. And then after a few days, when they answer the consumer's inquiries, the expiry date may have uh, passed. So please be more concerned about these issues. Well, not much money is involved, but for those who need telecommunication services, these are very important. They rely on the telecommunication systems to do business. So if you can perfect our laws so as to take better care of public needs, uh, it will be better to society. So thank you very much for attending this meeting. So much for this item. Next, uh, AOB. Members, any AOB? No? Meeting adjourned.